if you've got to compete, level the playing field so you've got the odds on maximising your favour. Business of Architecture UK, episode 30. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Hello and welcome to the business of architecture. And this week is another one of my conversations from my road trip up to the north and the wonderful city of Manchester, where I spoke with Paul Idden, who's originally from Liverpool. And I've just got written here in my notes, architect, marketer and brands. And Paul has had a really fascinating, unique career. He has run his own architectural company, um, grown it to a very large size. He did that for around, you know, that been in the industry for about 20 years. And then he moved over into marketing and brands. But he also still works with architects. He worked with Alan Jones on their recent campaign on the Reba elections. And he is just filled with energy passion and profound insights about marketing and many of the mistakes that architects face with their marketing and their sales and their business. So this interview really, I just tried to capture Paul's energy because I loved it and I was there for about, I don't know, three or four hours afterwards we're just talking and just listening to his stories about how they've, you know, how his company um has developed various food brands for you know sweets in in Denmark and just amazing things. So I really hope I've captured Paul's energy and intellect in this interview because he is a force to be reckoned with. So enjoy. The first question I'm going to ask you is, what do you do? How do you describe what it is you do, and how did you get there? What I do now? Yeah. Um, well, I run a brand and communication agency that primarily helps um, manufacturers communicate with architects in mm. the way that architects want to be communicated with. Um, part of what I do is in branding and design, um, but and that's to do with the, the FMCG, which is the food industry. Right. So we'll, we do things like um, licorice. So we do licorice pipes which are very, very popular in Denmark, <laughs> skipper pipes. Which is great are they fun. like the salted licorice? Salted and sweet. Right, um, yeah. But yeah the, Dan- yeah, the Danes and the Scandinavians really go for salted licorice, which is a bit of an acquired taste. Um, but once you acquire it, it's very nice. <laughs> very, very tasty. I dated a Swedish girl once, and she got me into those salted licorice. Yeah, yeah. The, um, I, I, so that we do, then we do like a gin brand we're doing at the minute, and... We we'll do crackers, mm. and then I say for some of our clients, we do all sorts of things in the food industry. So we're in the consumer industry a bit, so we are always thinking about what things mean and communicate, and that helps a bit with business to business, which is what the other side, eighty percent of our business is in, um, most of which is working in that sector in the construction sector, and which is the area I, I, I spend most of my time. Um, how did I get here? So pre- was that, was yeah. That, that so, your, so previously you were you were an architect. You were, I, I started training as an architect in uh, are you ready nineteen seventy nine. Uh, I went to Manchester Polytechnic School of Architecture, which became Kent Manchester School of Architecture when they joined. Yeah. Um, and then, then I, I I qualified in the end in nineteen eighty seven because I took a year off in the middle and went off and worked in uh, my brother's agency actually, uh, and that was a bit of a crisis of confidence. But when I went back, I kind of got stuck in. Mm. So, yeah, I qualified. I got picked up on my diploma show by what was then in Manchester, one of the hottest practices called Stevenson Mills. And I was like, oh. you know, and it was one of those things where I was planning to spend two months wandering around Europe with a backpack. And they said, they said, do you want to come and work with us? And I said, yeah. And they said, I said, when would you like me to start? And they said, how about next Tuesday? And that was 1986. And... That's it. I've been working ever since. And then I went on and was went in there as a junior architect, doing my, with, part two, mm. doing my part three. Then uh, the, all things to do with the economy. It's a long, long story, but Stevenson Mills, they split up and became two practices. I, we naturally went with one 
part, one of the partners. Um, and we carried on with that for seven years. I became an associate, then a director. Then we got hit by a recession and that practice, you know, yeah, 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 well, you know, we had to, it, was, it was the end of it. Mm. And we, it split, a, you know, so it kind of went, people went in separate ways. But one of the group was three of us um, set up OMI Architects, which is O'Dwyer McCall Idden. Right. Which are the people in the same building. It's next door. Yeah, yeah, they're my friends. And the two, the o, there's O'Dwyer, Phil O'Dwyer and Dave McCall. Dave McCall is still working at OMI. Right. Phil's retired and I left many years ago. Right, and they've still got the same name. Still got the same brand. And, you know, we have a good relationship. We talk to them a lot, you know, with, with the guys next door. Mm. So we set up OMI Architects and then it was quite tough, you know, and uh, a few things happened, which are, again, boring family stuff mainly. Um, I ended up um, actually helping my brother out for a few months what started for a few months um, and I never got away um, I ended up so so he, he wanted me just to help out while his partner was getting some treatment because she was very ill and I ended up basically um, starting work there and I couldn't I couldn't get out of it mm. I started working with one client and it just grew and he, he was grew. an architect as well no no this was a graphic marketing. designer marketing. right okay got it and I knew a little bit about it so I, he just wanted me to help sort of run the business side of it a bit mm. Um, but I started working with clients and I got on well with them and it was just one of those things. And one of them was called Arla Foods, which you may not have heard of them, but they do Lurpak, Anchor, Cravendale, the second biggest dairy company, or they might be the biggest now mm. in the UK. And they're, an, they're a Danish-Swedish cooperative. So I started working with those guys, a lot of Danish people there, and I got on well with them and they kept giving us more and more and more work and I couldn't get out. Because I was the, the contact. So after a couple of years, I realised that this is going to get really difficult. Mm. It was, in a sense, it was almost like a victim of our own success. Yeah. I wanted to be an architect, you know. And, but, you know, my family had moved down. So this is, I'm now living in Oxfordshire. And because long story short, I never got away. I ended up taking over the business. Mm. Um, then I met... Um, the people I'm with now, because I was competing against them. We were looking, the Danish people went back to Denmark and I was doing work for them in Denmark. So I was traveling to Denmark a lot and I kept coming up against these other agencies and one particular guy. Mm. And then finally, one of the clients, Danish clients said, you, you guys should speak because there's one project coming up and neither of you can, will win it unless you do it together. Mm. The rest is history. We merged, or in the end, they actually acquired us. And so I've been a you know part of this Danish agency group now for twelve years, and I run the UK end of the operation. And and what's your relationship now with the architectural industry and assisting architects with their with their marketing? Well, what happened was I kind of came to. So it dawned on me. We were working a lot in the food sector and some B2B. And I started to think, oh, this is going back about 10 years, um, maybe even longer. There's got to be some sort of synergy between having worked and been an architect for 20 odd years, including right the way through to practice owner. Yeah. So understanding the arc and the difficulties involved and what it is to be an architect and what the mindset, you know, all the stuff that you know about. And then the marketing and branding and communication side for like 10, 12 years at that point. Yeah. And there's got to be a good way to put this together. Um, so I, I started to think, you know, well, where do I start with that? And my first point of call was, was kind of maybe I could market my services to help architects brand and communicate themselves. Um, that went on for a while. It was a trickle. And like I said before, it's not the easiest thing to do with, yeah. with architects um, for what, all sorts of reasons. What did you, what did you find with them were some of the most difficult obstacles with that kind of, you know, teaching architects marketing or running like an agency where you're helping architects with their marketing? Well, it was always a bit of a sideline. We made like 90% of our money doing other things. Right. Um, but it was overcoming a few things. There were some inherent 
if you like, cognitive biases towards words like sales and marketing. They don't fit comfortably with uh, some but not all of (laughs) architects' um, perception of how the world should work. Yeah. The idea of selling yourself um, back then, I think it's slightly better now, but was seen as somehow perhaps a bit demeaning Mm. um, or... And also, they didn't have the budgets to kind of cover the kind of work that, that needs to be done. Yeah. And one of the big things was when we talked about the brand, most of them thought about a logo. Mm. And when I went and explained, well, look, the logo, if you like, the logo is tip of the iceberg, seven-eighths of the brand are underwater and invisible. And it's things about positioning and market analysis and all of the stuff that goes behind that. So when he started talking about the kind of work that was needed, got two kind of reactions. Either they didn't have the budget or time to, to, to get involved in that, or they thought it was really about design, mm. which it isn't really. And so I suppose a lack of understanding of what branding is. <clears throat> and again, there was a lot of, there was some baggage associated with that. You know, because the people start to think of Coca Cola, or and they think, you know, you know, it's it's trying to get money out of people. Mm. And what, what, why do you think that there is this kind of paradigm that exists within the architectural industry, which is cautious to branding and marketing and sales, or that these types of words somehow get tainted with a with a sort of insidious odour, if you like. I mean, for a long time, I thought it was a kind of deliberate sort of sniffiness, you know, sort of, Mm. they were above that kind of thing. Then I started to realise it wasn't really like that. There was, it was, you know, architects think they're trained to be part of a continuum that's gone on for a couple of thousand years. And, you know, their primary objective was to make the world a beautiful place and to do good. and, And somehow, you know, this was all a bit of a, do I have to do this? It's kind of a distraction. Mm. Um, but, but I think genuinely it's, it's just lack of training. Um, yeah, I don't, I hear various things about how many hours are devoted to business studies, sales, marketing, but I know it's not a lot because I go and do lectures at Manchester University, Salford University, Queens, places like that, and talk about marketing and branding. It's pretty clear to me that they don't have any background in this. Um, and, you know, architects have got to learn an awful lot about an awful lot of things. And I think there's a bit of a perception in academia, which is changing now, because I know some guys in Manchester and, and, uh, and you know, people like Rob Hyde and Alan Jones and Cube Queens, who take this stuff, you know, this is really serious. This is, you know, you need to know this. So it is changing. But back then it was difficult. Yeah. And, you know, it's the kind of thing you find consultants doing for them as opposed to agencies, which have a, were more expensive. Than, yeah. You know, hourly rates are high because we've got all lists to, to support and designers and copywriters and mm. project managers and stuff. Whereas you can go and get, a, you can do that freelance wise. And then the big practices, they'll go to the big agencies. So, so it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, yeah, a long-term strategy. Yeah. And we do bits and pieces, but it's not really our area of focus. And then, and then I suppose the the biggest change was when I got involved in Manchester Society of Architects. Right. I was invited by the then president um, to come along and try and help them, if you like, rebrand themselves and re kind of re-energise. And I've been involved ever since, which is, I think it's nearly seven years now something like that. Um, and we actually rebranded them physically. So, you know, the look and everything, but also the kind of the mission behind it and the asking what architects wanted from the society. Because mm. Manchester's the biggest outside of London. And if you actually take, realise that London society is there's five around London, well, Manchester's probably bigger than any one of them. Yeah. So... Take it as an individual society in Manchester's the biggest in the UK. I can safely say that, I think. Um, and it's quite a homogenous sort of group because we're not spread out over 
a lot of areas like mm. you are in London. Um, and I've been involved ever since. So, and I get quite heavily involved in the architect scene and help. My primary job is to marketing, communications, and sponsorship. Yeah. So, getting the money in, you know, delivering value for sponsors and um, helping sort of to communicate what, what we're doing. So, when we have an awards and we have a dinner and we have. And you know, a symposium, and then we have a CPD series, lecture series, you know, the usual sort of thing. Um, just trying to take it up to that next level. Um, and one of the things we did was what's our mission? You might call it in our game, what's the elevator pitch? Mm. Um, and we spent quite a lot of time on that, and then we boiled it down to to champion and nurture the present and future architects of Manchester. That's it. And we deliberately didn't use words like support and promote. We wanted emotive words. Yeah. Because if we were to champion, we really wanted to champion Something it. Something powerful. Yeah, yeah and nurture means that we, you know, we, we help people and we shout it from the rooftops, you know. It's, it's you know, we, you know we're, we're emotive about it, you know. It's, yeah, it's got to have some power, some energy. Mm. And that hasn't changed. And, and then, you know... Basically, whatever we do supports that philosophy, if you like, our mission. Mm. So it's quite, it's quite an interesting, you've had such a sort of interesting career that's gone very... It's weird. Yeah, it's gone, <laughs> it's gone very deep into a lot of interesting subjects and industries. And it's kind of given you a very like unique strategic position to be able to see the architectural industry kind of one foot in and one foot out. Yeah, you, 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 sorry, sorry. And in, in, and in that kind of context, what would you say are the biggest obstacles facing architects as, uh, you know, uh, practicing professionally? Well, putting my marketing hat on for a minute, it's positioning. Um, it's pretty clear to me over the last 25 years since I was in practice. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, that's right, edit that. Um, the architects, um, lots of specialisms have, ad- have arisen. You know, fire engineering was around when I was in practice, but now it's commonplace. Acoustic engineering, mm. project management, um, you know, the, the, there's all sorts of areas, planning consultants, where architects, te- traditional territory has been kind of nibbled away at. And um, procurement pra- practices, you know, design and build, the, you know, the architect's position has become uh, difficult because in, I think in some circles they're viewed as being the people who make buildings expensive, mm. which I don't think is true at all. But it's, it's all about perception, you know, in marketing, you know, it's perception is reality. Yeah. And there are other groups, other parts of the construction industry are quite happy to see the architect's role diminish. Mm. And, you know, I, I, I don't like that, actually, because I think architects are, and I know this may sound a bit emotive, I think architects are incredibly important. Because mm. who else is trained to think the way they do in the industry? To think long term, to think about social value, about civic pride. Uh, architects are a good thing, and I hate to think what we'd replace them with. Mm. So, yeah, positioning, I think, is the big problem. And I think that um, that's going to take some fairly radical thinking. Um, is, it, is it something that individual practices can address, or is it something that needs to be addressed like by the whole profession, like both as, as, as a sort of unified strategy of repositioning what architect means, what the architect does, what is the architect's value? I, I think it's both. It's got to be bottom up and top down. Mm. Um, I mean, the RIBA play an incredibly important role. Uh, and as you know, they're, they're there in to, 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 to lobby government, to be a voice within the industry. Um, but I think there's, there are a couple of problems, um, which I, I have been quite, I've talked about quite vocally, you know, mm. vocally, I've talked about quite a bit. And um, one of them is the Royal Charter, which they're kind of stuck with, which is the promotion of architecture. 
not architects. Yeah. Whereas what most architects want is, is to, for architects to be promoted because there's a lot of people passing themselves off as architects. Mm. And there's a lot of confusion about the word architectural, for instance. Yeah, and from a consumer point of view, it's very difficult to distinguish between yeah. someone who's selling architectural services and an architect. And what is the difference except for the, for the fees? Exactly, and it's, it's you know in a digital world, you, you know, I mean, one of the one of the ones which really get, gets to me is interior architect. Mm. There's no such thing. There is no, there's no, you know, if you got the word architect on it, with the exception of landscape architect or some of the ones used in software, computer and software yeah. industry, architect is a legally protected title. Mm. Yeah, if you go into LinkedIn and you filter it, there are th- literally thousands of infringements going on with interior architects. And at one point, I actually couldn't believe I did this. Harrods, was it Harrods or a famous department store, should we say that, advertised for an interior architect. And then they listed out what the job functions were. And it was mainly about interior design. So I actually got on to the HR department of this famous, very famous department store and said, do you realise that you're infringing the Architects Registration Act 1997? Because if you're looking for an architect, then they have to be ARB registered. Mm. And the guy was stunned. Really? I said, interior architect is, is, is actually, I said, you're, you, 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 that breaks the law. They took it down immediately. So I don't think there's any malice in it. I think they just, they don't know. Yeah. And there's an argument, well, who's telling them? Um, and for the RIBA, they've got to they've got to perform a lot of functions. And I think in the past few years, with the way they look, things like Grand Designs House of the Year, for instance, and stuff like that, I think they've done a, a really good job getting behind the right kind of mechanics. But we still got a bit of a problem in who who promotes architects. Yeah. Um. And you know that for me is part of the positioning problem. So. Lots of practices can do their bit, but we need something at a, a top level to start talking about architects and what the, the value they add. Yeah. Um, and what they can do. Rather than architecture, which is an abstract concept. Mm. I mean, architects have a difficult enough time just trying to say what architecture is, never mind trying to explain it to, to people who aren't, you know, deep into the kind of, you know, don't understand the Vitruvian, you know, uh, uh, well, you know, Vitruvius and... Palladio and all the kind of... Yeah. yeah, yeah, well, you know, commodity, firmness and delight, you know. Yeah. Um, so to me, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's a big problem that the whole industry needs to tackle. Um, but of course, most architects' practices are just trying to get by yeah. and survive. So to then load on them this additional burden of, you know, what you've got to promote, I suppose... In marketing terms, what we call a category, as well as the product. Right. Okay. So it's acting as you're promoting architects, well, as well as just your individual services. Well, if you take a good analogy of this, is a supermarket aisle. Right. Okay. Now, supermarket aisles are broken down into categories of product. Okay. So one of them is chocolate. Um, what's the biggest chocolate brand in the UK? Cadbury's. Cadbury's. Okay. So Cadbury is what you would call a category captain. Right. Which is a really, really cheesy term. And I apologise to all the Marxists looking at this because everybody hates it. Um, but they, you know, they're, they're, they're instrumental in steering the public perception of what chocolate is mm. as it changes over time. And, uh, you know, Cadbury's particular positioning is one of general accessibility, fun and enjoyment you know yeah it's not premium and it's not sort of you know you know they, they so so you know the way you know the biggest players in the category have to do the most work for the category as well as themselves so they have like an inherent responsibility yeah so your big players yeah i suppose you could argue the biggest players the foster and partners the bdps the, who've got serious kind of critical mass mm. They probably do quite a lot in promoting the category of what architects do, actually. Um, I just don't, I just think we need to be a bit more explicit. What I'm saying is you can't, 
you know, your little chocolate brand on the bottom shelf on the right hand corner, specialist chocolate brand. Yeah. They can only do so much with their marketing budget and their presence to actually promote good chocolate. Yeah. Is that a good example? Yeah. Uh, no, it, 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 it makes it makes sense that there's these larger practices also have a responsibility because they are representing architecture and architects as a as a whole. Well, take, for instance, Foster and Partners. Yeah. I mean, wow. I mean, they are heroes. I mean, you know, uh, 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 what Norman Foster done, considering he's from, he's from Manchester. By the way, he's one of us, you know. He's a Manchester <laughs> member. He doesn't know it, but he's a member of Manchester Society of Architects because he was born here. Um, what that guy's done for British architecture, mm. along with F- Terry Farrell, Nick Grimshaw, Michael Hopkins, um, Richard Rogers, you know, the Brits who built the modern world. Yeah. Um, they did so much for British architects uh, and architecture globally. Um, I'm in awe, you know. Uh, and, you know, when you have your little practice, you think somebody's out there actually leading the way mm. and saying, you know, yeah. I even remember Sterling Wilford, and they did the Stats Gallery in Stuttgart. And was it BMW used it on an ad? Didn't and it say. was British architecting on YouTube. But architecture and architects found themselves into TV advertising mm. of a car product. And it was about British architects. And that, that to me was like, you know, when you, it, 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 you know, you, you know, when it matters, when it hits con- consumer, um, apparently the consumer zeitgeist. Mm. Um, so, so, fr- so from the, the bottom up then perspective, like what is it that small architecture practices can do? What can those little chocolate bars do to a elevate their own marketing prowess and make life easier? What, what's, what, and what are the sort of mistakes that lots of small practices make? Um, my favorite one is, um, how many architects practices, I think I've mentioned this to you before, how many architects practices have mentioned in the first paragraph, sometimes in the first sentence, <laughs> award-winning architects? Okay, and I told this, it's, it's light-hearted, but it's many a true word said in jest. Mm. Hold up a £20 note and say, anybody who hasn't got that in the first paragraph can come and take the £20 note out of my hand. The reality is nearly every architect's website says award-winning architects. Yeah. And it's important, okay? But it's not a differentiator. Because if everybody's award-winning, then which awards and so on and so forth. So with small architects practices, I think it's it's I think that's where the RIBA can play a big role mm. in helping them with tools and assets and techniques to help them, you know, with 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 business marketing sales techniques you know um so and then practices taking advantage of that and using them finding ways to differentiate their offer to look to create a different look to feel different to you know um, be that quirky little chocolate brand or mm. you the craft beer at the moment yeah or the craft gins there's hundreds of them okay and you've searched for individual identity and 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 uh, and a feeling, you know. Um, I think the other thing they can do is come together as grassroots organisations. Don't wait for the Institute. Mm. So get involved together um, in your own towns and cities in the way that Manchester Architects has done. We're a grassroots organisation. Get involved, you know, change the perceptions and yet what you're doing there is you're building the category yeah as well as your own brand yeah in marketing terms a lot of people know sometimes you have to work in the category with other brands to help build a category as well as looking after your own business it, it's, it's really interesting I've never thought about it quite like that before actually that the, the importance of uh, you know smaller practices or all architects contributing to the category as a whole actually strengthens your own position and also gives you potential to find a unique voice in that as well. Well, also categories compete with other categories. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Um, everybody thinks the Danes are very, very healthy. 
And of course they are. They look great. They look great. Did you know that the Danes eat three times as much candy confectionery than the Brits? <laughs> you know, the kind of Haribo, you know, the, they eat loads of that stuff. Right. Okay. And proportionally less chocolate. Part of that being licorice, you know, the licorice pipes. Yeah. Um, so the, the chocolate category competes with the candy category. Yeah. Okay, now if you t- zoom out there again and think architecture, well, architects as a category compete with other people in category, or perhaps look at it the other way around. There are other categories competing with the architect category. Mm. That can be architectural technologists, it can be project managers, it can be loosely what somebody said, you know, um, plan drawers, whatever they are, you know, from a whole mix of backgrounds. Um, now, you could argue that small practices are competing or they're in their category. Their competition is technologists and all these other people who think, hey, I can do that, but in a third the price. And yet, we're not pushing enough the fact, yeah, but we sell a different product. Mm. You know, it's not the same product. You're literally comparing, you know, Haribo with green and blacks, 70% cocoa, you know, um, single sourced um, uh, chocolate, you know, crafted, handcrafted, you know, the language is used as well differentiates it. So in, in like kind of practical terms, how does that work itself out? How does an architectural practice start to really s- like sell what it is that they do okay. better? Well, the first thing I always say is start with your market. Okay, what you want to say is not is not as important as what your target market wants to hear or needs to hear. Yeah. So... If you go back to Marks and Spencer's, okay, Marks and Spencer started a lot of this, you know. Do you remember, this is not vanilla, this is Madagascan vanilla. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It was that Irish actress that used to do these mellifluous, you know. So, and then you, the language in which was used to communicate the quality of that product. Yeah, you go mm. and look at any packaging, premium packaging, and it's always sourced it has a way called provenance or origin okay you know um so I, I, one thing i do is say well first of all what are the expectations if you're in the residential market for instance what are the expectations of your audience your target audience what are they actually looking for mm. well i suspect what they're looking for is an award-winning architectural project what they're looking for is a home that's going to deliver on every level they want um, so what's the language they would use or want to hear? So, and so that's about the nature of the language, the tone of voice, the service. So even just flipping that around for a minute, just that simple act yeah. about those people are probably only going to commission an architect once or twice. Um, and even if they do it more often than that, You want to talk to them in the way that makes them feel good and think, ah, yeah, this is the person I want. This is the practice I want because they understand me. They understand what my needs are, but also what I want. And that could be a whole load of things. Um, How many architects do that? I don't know. We've advised that to a number of architects' practices. Mm. What is it your audience wants? Give him it. Give it to them. Speak to them in the way, but if... It's the difference between somebody buying what you what buying a service from you and you selling the service to them. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so you understand the difference in inbound and outbound marketing, of course. Yeah. So, so most architects do outbound. Right. They're out there selling, 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 selling. Pitching inbound is when people. Thing. Yeah. Inbound is when people come to you. Yeah. They want what you've got, which is what we all want to have. We. Yeah, and you know. I strongly suspect this, you know, it's when ZHA and Bjark Ingalls and Fosters, etc. that's where they get most of their... I don't think they're out there necessarily doing new business development. They could be, but I would imagine quite a lot of them come to them. Yeah. Which is inbound. So you want to do as much of that as possible because, 
you know, it's, that's brilliant, isn't it? That's what you want. People saying, I hear you do, you guys are experts in this, or you do, you know, somebody told me this is what you want. Word of mouth is a good example of that. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's developing those mechanics. It's like, it's like the analogy of catching butterflies. Have you heard that before where the sort of the analogy of, you know, most people go out and try and catch butterflies with a, with a net and you're kind of, you know, just waving wildly yeah. at them and you might catch one butterfly, but the people who are masterful at butterflies know how to create a garden with which the butterflies just come and naturally settle into. That's a lovely example, actually, and very true, mm. very true. And that is basically inbound marketing. Right. Um, as opposed to walking around with a branded baseball bat. You know, yeah. Sort of, you know, this is... Um, and and the, the problem with that is it requires... Um, and architects should actually be good at this, actually. Um, I, I promote this like, as a bleak strategy, is that you don't aim exactly at you want. What you want be, is almost like uh, indirect to the, what mm. you're doing. Um, what's an example of that? Um, well, you know, sailing, you know, if you're sailing into the wind, you have to tack. Yeah. Yeah. It's still the most direct way of getting from A to B, but you have to, first of all, go west, then go east. And really what you want to do is go north. So it's, it's kind of finding the, there was another example in my head there, but that, that's the one that kind of sprang to mind. But a bleak strategy um, works because you, you're not actually technically selling then. You're, you find a way to actually people to talk to you about what they want. Yeah. So like so becoming like an educator of, of a marketplace. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're already doing the work to understand who your demographic is, what they actually want. How does this... Um, so you've got that kind of... For, for, for what it's worth, by the way, on that one, the one thing you don't do, I think... Is, is what I see a few th- in different places where you say you give people free advice. Mm. Now, I know on Business of Architecture, your guys are very clear on this point, and he's right. Never give away the crown jewels. You know, you, you talk to them about something else until they come to you. Sorry. Yeah, no, t- and totally. And that's something that um, so many of architects are guilty of doing is giving away free advice or kind of getting involved in the pitch or doing huge amounts of work with you know for free and then actually you're one of maybe four architects who are I know. who are doing the same who are doing the same thing and it's it's so kind of heartbreaking as well because it's such a huge amount of resource um, and then it becomes like a common practice and it's just the kind of cycle that goes around and around and around. It, it, it's, it's the architect's nature. I mean, again, I don't want to make generalizations, but architects are generally positive people. Yeah. And they mean the, they want to do the best, you know, I mean that I was talking to one person in the manufacturer. He said, oh, our architects are all cynical. They just want to copy and paste things, do that. And I went, you've not understood at all. Mm. You can't get through seven years of training by being cynical. It just, you just, you collapse after the degree. Mm. I think if you scratch any architect on these, you find an optimist who always thinks this is my chance. This is the opportunity. This is where I can make a difference. Yeah. This is where I can do a really, really good job. And so constantly they get caught up in thinking, yeah, we'll pitch for this one because we've got a good chance of winning it. But statistically, you know, it, it doesn't, that doesn't support it. Mm. it, it um, because usually when you're in a competition with a, certainly in private development where there's no rules, then you find yourself competing against an incumbent who's always got an advantage. And I don't want to be rude, but I think a lot of people will take advantage of that. Uh, taking advantage of good people's good nature. And it's, um, it's a very hard thing not to do, actually. Mm. But in a four-way pitch, you don't call it a pitch, and you've got a competition. You know, yeah. such. If you don't have a work with a client before and you don't know them, you've probably got a minuscule chance of winning because the one who, you might be just there providing a context for the one they know and sharpening their price or providing, worst of all, for, for providing free ideas. 
So if 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 you're an architect and you're and you know you're you're hearing this and you you can relate to it and it's something that you're actively doing, what would you suggest as a way to kind of Oof. stop doing that? Or it's like, very what, hard. What's the alternative? It's very hard because if you, uh, I mean, when I've taught this before to some architects, some say immediately, "Well, if we don't do it, somebody else will." Mm. So it's very very hard because it's understandable. They think, "Well, if you you've got to be in it to win it." Um, I think there are some techniques you can probably use, but it, it means sort of like taking a deep breath and standing back and thinking, don't jump in with both feet. Um, and I, I, I certainly don't want to sound patronised to people who, who do this all the time. And yeah. I know how hard it is to be an architect. But there are ways you can level the playing field a bit according to certain techniques and sales, aren't there? You know, where you... Well, the example I, I think I, I, I've talked about before is if you're an architect and you get an email out the blue from a local developer who you've heard of but you haven't worked with mm. saying, hello, Jim, um, Rion, <laughs> um, we hear great things about your practice. I mean, they're good at all this, yeah? And, and you're, um, like, you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and it's sort of, you know, flatty straight away, you yeah. know? everybody likes their ego stroked um, we wonder if you'd like to provide a price or you know a fee proposal for doing this piece of work you know so many houses flats on this particular site and then it's almost like oh and by the way can you provide a few visuals of what you think should go on there and, mm. you know and a site plan and stuff like that now that should send alarm bells going off for several reasons one is if you don't know them Okay, you've not worked with them before, then clearly you're not number one on the list. You're not in column A. You're probably not in column B. Yeah. So you're probably column C or D, which means that your chances of winning it are not equal. So in a four-way competition, it's not 25%. It could be like 11%. Mm. Because the odds are stacked in the favor of the incumbents or the people they've worked for before. And there could be a motivation. They're generally just doing this to sharpen the, to keep the the normal architect, because most developers generally work with the same architects, don't they? Because it's shorthand. So in that situation, I'd say something like, okay, well, the first thing you can do is, is not spend a week doing a fee proposal and some sketches. <laughs> the first thing you do is, look at it for the way it is and think, okay, we've never heard of this person, so what's the first thing you do? Well, the first thing you do is do nothing. And then, then you think, okay, I want to meet them. Because first of all, if you, if you, don't, if you never met people face to face, you're easy to dismiss. They don't care what happens. They care less what happens to you because they've never met you. Yeah. It's, it's a human thing. So first thing you want to do is get face to face meeting. So one thing I suggested there, it would be replying to the email. Oh, thank you very much. It's lovely, you know, very nice to hear from you. And, you know, we're very flattered that you've, 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 you know, approached us and, uh, it's very kind of you to say, you know, be kind back, do the same thing back. Then say, before we do any type of work with a new client, we always like to meet people for a quick cup of coffee and meet them and understand them better. And, you know, Really, to understand your needs and your business and what you need to get out of it. Could we come and see you for an hour and buy you a cup of coffee mm. or something? Now, if the developer emails you back and says, yeah, that'd be great. Can you come and see me? I'll tell you what, I'm in wherever, wherever. Can you? Then go and see them. If they come back and say, no, no, well, you know, unfortunately, I'm really busy for the next two weeks. Could you just send that? My advice is don't go any further. Yeah. Because they've got no intention of meeting you. Then it doesn't sound right, does it? No, exactly. It's, 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 a, big, it's a big commitment. There's a, there's a red flag gone up there. Exactly. So, you know, re read what's actually in the mail, you know. And if they do meet you, which is great, then the object lesson there is you're not going to... It's probable you're not going to be able to eliminate the competition. Mm. You might be able to if you've got a particularly relevant set of offerings but you know uh, but the one thing you can do is then sit with them and ask them lots of open-ended questions with the objective of finding out more than that's in the brief so that you can find out maybe something that they 
haven't really put in words in, mm. in writing, but they've probably told their favorite architects. So then all of a sudden you're leveling the playing field and that's the objective. Yeah. If you've got to compete, level the playing field. So you've got the odds on maximizing your favor. And you never know, they might think you're hilarious, great people to work with, and you could tip it the other way. You never know. But the point is, is that never take it on face value. Yeah. And think about what do I do now before I start spending money? That's just one example, mm. I'd say. That's brilliant. That's very interesting. Um, I think we've pretty much just run out of time here, but that's, thank you. <laughs> that's absolutely like there's loads of brilliant stuff there. So thank you very much. Just, you yeah, absolutely. Just, I mean, I said before, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a passionate believer in architects and architecture, you know, and, you know, I, part of what I do is genuinely because I worry about it. Mm. I've got lots of friends who are practice owners mm. and I want them to, succeed because these people are good I mean they're good and they've worked hard and I think they deserve it so I'm a great believer in architects and architecture and uh, we just need to find a way to improve our, the, the lot a bit for architects yeah anyway totally thanks very much indeed thank you thank you so that is a wrap thank you for listening the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.